Hello, I'm Jeremy Sparks. I'm going to be walking you through tactical mission planning. And so, um, slide please. I'm going to give you a little bit about my background. So, I am a redneck from Ohio. Uh, the uh, PC way of saying that is I'm an Appalachian American uh, from the Midwest. And I fell backwards into cybersecurity and tactical planning expertise. Uh, simply uh, just, you know, the, the Air Force uh, made this as not, you know, they opened up this opportunity for me. And I kind of, I fell into it. I didn't necessarily seek it out, uh, but I'm so thankful uh, for the opportunity itself. So prior enlisted from the Ohio Air National Guard, uh, in, where I was a vehicle operator of all things, um, but we did do planning for our convoy operations. Um, and many of those same planning considerations are used even in you know, the, the offensive and defensive cyber operations missions that I did later in my career. Uh, but I am from Ohio. Uh, I went, I used my GI Bill to go through Miami University, got my degree in computer science. Um, and then ended up uh, going to the Air Force Weapons School where I learned a lot about mission planning. And that was the first time that I saw expert mission planning uh, at the tactical level. And that made all the difference, um, both for my own understanding and then also how it's been applied in cyberspace operations uh, since, since then. Um, mostly because you know, that experience itself uh, allowed me to apply the tactical planning principles to future uh, defensive and cyber, uh, defensive, offensive, and Doden operations uh, later in my career. And uh, we also use that as the foundation for the uh, tactical plan, what is now the tactical planners course in San Antonio, originally started as the Michigan Commanders course out there. Uh, but also ended up doing a fellowship out at MIT Lincoln Laboratories where many of the principles were applied uh, there as well. And then also I uh, had an opportunity to go to the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies um, at Maxwell Air Force Base and was able to see what planning looks like at the strategic level of war. In terms of my cyberspace operations background, so I worked at the squadron level, the group level, the wing level, the NAF, and then also the combatant command. So I uh, did some time at the uh, AFCERT, the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team, did a lot of incident response just around the world where tactical planning uh, came in handy, although I wish I had had all of the planning principles that I learned at weapons school for uh, those experiences. I hadn't attended weapons school at that point in my career, uh, but man, that would have been handy. Uh, so I spent some time as a crew commander and then as an incident responder and, and then did some uh, digital forensics. I later ended up working up at the 624th, uh, what is now the 616th Ops Center, so got to look at the operational level of war. And then later on went to the combatant command. So I was at United States Cyber Command. I was a mission commander for a counterterrorism team. And I was also a tactical planner for an IO team while I was out there. Did uh, you know, an aggregate of about 3,000 or so uh, operational hours. And uh, that experience in, in aggregate has uh, been used to inform this curriculum that I'm going to share with you. So we've got lots of tactical planning experience, some operational level experience uh, planning as well. So I look forward to sharing that with you today. All right, so objectives for this course, slide please. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the art and science of tactical planning. There is both of those. Some art you know, where you uh, have to interpret, you have to be creative. There's also some, some science, whereas there's some uh, some must do, some uh, a uh, some rigor uh, that you can learn, and, and then uh, through processes, and then the art is often just through experience and interpretation. So I'm going to share with you today uh, the art and science as pl of planning. I'm also going to familiarize you with some mission planning products and debriefing techniques, and the expected outcome from this. Uh, Training is really just to make you more comfortable, more confident in tactical mission planning. Slide, please. So why is this important? Well, tactical planning is directly linked to our operational outcomes. So imagine, let's talk for a second about the, uh, the difference between operational level planning and tactical level planning. So at the operational level of war, so at the Air Ops Center or the CAOC or the Combined Air Ops Center, you would expect that they're working on air campaigns. So let's imagine there's a notion of 100-day air campaign. And so that 100-day air campaign will be divided up into 100 ATO days. And so in each of those ATO 
days is going to have discrete tactical missions. So again, using rough surgery here, if we were going to have an air campaign for 100 days over in this part of let's say, Afghanistan to um, soften up certain targets, to decrease ISIL Khorasan forces and their recruitment uh, efforts in a particular area, that 100-day campaign would be made up of discrete tactical missions. And so at the operational level of war, they would be using JP-50 and operational level planning to accomplish that campaign plan. And at the end of that uh, operational level planning effort, you would the output of that would be an order. And typically the ATO, the air tasking order. The cyber corollary there is at the operational level of war, you're going to at the 16th Air Force staff and at the 616th where they're uh, performing a lot of the operational level planning for cyber, for Air Force cyber. The output of their planning is going to be the CTO or the cyber tasking order. That cyber tasking order will task tactical units to go perform discrete tactical missions. Well, the type of planning required to accomplish those tasks is different than, the opera than operational level planning. So the, in, the why behind it is, you know, why do we do tactical level planning? Why is it important? Well, it's so that we can be mission effective on the tasks that are given to us to, uh, to perform. And ultimately that ties back, you know, when we start talking strat to task, the, each of those tactical tasks maps all the way back to how we um, increase national security. So um, bifurcating operational level planning and tactical level planning, I'll just give you a couple of good rules of thumb. If they start talking about timing, and when we start talking about uh, synchronization, deconfliction, priorities, COAs, all those, many of those are kind of like key buzzwords, key phrases um, when they, that you're planning at the operational level of war. Especially when they start talking about the inputs being commander's guidance and output being an order. And so uh, you want to use the right tool for the right job. And you know, otherwise, it'd be like using a screwdriver when you need a wrench. Tactical pl uh, planning processes are, are appropriate for tactical problem sets. Operational level planning processes are perfect for operate, you know, uh, 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 operational level planning requires operational planning processes. So uh, you want to know what level of war you're planning for and so that you use the right process. We're going to talk about tactical planning. It's important because you won't be mission effective without it. Slide. So why is the plan brief, execute, debrief, that operational algorithm, why is that the path to operationalize the cyber warfare community? Well, if I were to ask you, what is the most operationally mature community anywhere in the Department of Defense? What would you say? You, a lot of people, when I ask that question, they want to say the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets, and they're right. Those are operationally mature communities. Also, for the Air Force, you're probably going to hear you know, fighter pilots. That's also, you know, th those are all accurate answers. So when we, but why? Often, oftentimes, people say, well, it's because they're ready at a moment's notice. They're highly trained. They're uh, very mission effective. There's a number of reasons, and, and, and all those are uh, good reasons for why you know, for th th they're, uh, they're indicators that we're talking about or describing a operationally mature community. Now, how did they get that way, though? So fighter pilots didn't start that way. You know, when we look at World War I, World War II, they, that, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have those same, uh, that same level of operational maturity. Same with the Green Berets so, and the Navy SEALs. So what is it that allowed them to mature? Well, frankly, they just, they did it by, uh, they matured by doing. And more specifically, it, there's this algorithm, this operational algorithm, plan, brief, execute, debrief, plan, brief, execute, debrief. They keep running through it. And at the end of it, you know, they are this, you know, because they are a complex adaptive system, meaning they learn from their mistakes. And so if you run through this algorithm thousands and thousands of times and iteratively uh, with each iteration they're getting a little bit better each time they can't help but mature that is the natural outcome and so uh, tactical planning is a key key part of that um, you know it's the that 
the plan brief, execute debrief, but planning specifically, we'll start with today. We will walk through the entire uh, operational algorithm, but we'll start with planning first. But that is the that that is the key to operationalizing the cyber uh, warfare community. And the, um, why is it so important? Well, without it, we will just remain perpetual amateurs, making the same mistakes over and over again. We can't afford that. I mean, the, imper the imperative is there. Russia and China are working very hard uh, to uh, undermine our democracy, to challenge us. They operate in that space because they can. They don't want to dogfight against the United States in the skies because we have technical overmatch. We would defeat them. And so they operate in the space where they can. And so uh, without plan, brief, execute, debrief, and, 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 and uh, expert level tactical planning, we will remain perpetual amateurs. And you know, uh, tactical planning and, and the plan, brief, execute, debrief operational algorithm is the difference between JV and varsity. And we will remain JV unless we move, you know, unless we adopt these operational behaviors. Slide, please. So why is it important for undergraduate cyber warfare uh, training students? Well, this is the first opportunity for many of our students to implement these principles. And we want them to be able to do it under the expert instruct, instruction uh, of our experienced captains and, and, uh, and officers. And so this is a great spot for them to do it here at the schoolhouse. And we look forward to their feedback. And this is also an opportunity for us to observe in a safe environment uh, their, uh, their performance, the student's performance, and then be able to provide them guided feedback. Slide, please. So when we start thinking about you know, the many, you know, it's, the, the why is, it's, it's really multi-causal. There's no one single why. There's no silver bullet to how we mature. There's no silver bullet to why it's important. It's, there's a lot of entanglement uh, for the rationale and the why. Another reason is because it's required. U.S. Cyber Command Operating Instruction 3300 TAG 06 mandates that every mission that is operated, that, that is conducted under the authority of United States Cyber Command must be uh, mission planned, briefed, and debriefed. And so there's a mandate to do it, so that's another important why. And also because science. Science tells us that the more that we do it, the, the, the more that we do any one thing, especially if we're a complex adaptive system, if we are learning from those mistakes, aka the debrief process, in, in the lessons learned process, then we will become better, which is, which is important. Slide, please. So when I talked a little bit about the science behind it, so not only does uh, you know, science tell us about the evolutionary algorithm, you know, regardless of whether or not you, you know, your faith accommodates that. Um, there's a great book about, uh, by, I believe it's Beinhacker called The Origin of Wealth. And he talks about the variation, selection, and amplification process. Think of it almost like survival of the fittest. Hey, this works, this doesn't work. We should do this more often, or we should not do this more often. It just makes you more survivable. Um, so, um, not only does that, does that particular um, uh, algorithm of, you know, let's see what happened, this looks like it worked, this looks like it didn't work, and then let's try that again. Not only does that process help make you more mission successful, but then we also have science telling us that the more participatory an activity is, the more likely we are to retain it. So a great example of that is the old Chinese proverb, hey, tell me and I'll forget. Show me, and I'll remember, and, but involve me, and I'll understand. And so our version of involve me here at the schoolhouse is on the bottom half of this learning pyramid. So what you're seeing here is uh, science tells us that there will only be about 5% knowledge retention from a student if they're just lectured at. But if they're able to participate, which is going to be these activities below this dash line, they're much more likely to retain that information. And so another reason why plan, brief, execute, debrief is so important is because it, it's a forcing function to remain below that dashed line. So mission planning is going to be right here at discussion group. Mission briefing is going to be down here around teaching others. Mission execution, you know, it, it, mission execution can be in demonstration and practicing by doing. And then mission debriefing is going to be down here in teaching others. Because you're, you're, telling, you're telling your colleagues, you're telling your fellow students, hey, 
this is what we did on our mission. It didn't work. Don't do that. Don't be us. Um, this sucked. Let's suck less next time. So uh, the plan, brief, execute, debrief algorithm really does keep you down here on the bottom half of the pyramid. Slide, please. More reasons for the why. You know, so again, I mentioned that it's multi-causal, a lot of entanglement. Um, is because of the, the threat landscape. So when we, when we take a look at what the, the opportunities are, both for defensive and offensive, we're seeing that that is increasing, not decreasing. And the United States lives in the glassiest of houses when it comes to our vulnerabilities, right? So um, when we start talking about our industrial control systems and uh, critical infrastructure, we're getting more of it, not less of it. And so uh, the bad guys know that, and our adversaries want to take advantage of it. Slide, please. We also know that our uh, the threat actors, the advanced persistent threats that we're working to, um, to outmaneuver, they're complex adaptive systems as well. And so they're learning from their mistakes. Every time we catch them, they're working even harder to um, maneuver around our countermeasures. And we also understand that from an, from an offensive perspective, as we maneuver inside an adversary target space, that you know, our adversary um, network administrators are becoming more savvy. And so, you know, we want to be able to um, operate below uh, the threshold of being observed. And so, uh, the more savvy they are, um, the, the, the higher the risk that we will be discovered. And so, that's another reason why it's so important that we plan for those. Um, slide, please. We also understand that adversary OODA loops or observe, orient, decide, and act loops you know, are becoming compressed. They're shrinking. And so this particular slide was taken from a CrowdStrike report a couple of years ago. Um, this is the breakout speed or the breakout time by uh, various threat actors, um, the fastest being the Russian and uh, advanced persistent threats. So they're just below 19 minutes from the time that they have initial compromise to the time that they start moving laterally through a network. And so as adversary OODA loops shrink, and they are shrinking, it is incumbent upon uh, the defenders, like uh, the airmen that are being trained in this schoolhouse, to be able to plan for that, to be able to optimize their response times to outmaneuver our adversaries. And we want our OODA loop to be much more compressed than our adversaries, which is why planning is so important, and also being a complex adaptive system, learning why did this take? Why did this particular part of the incident response uh, process take so long? You know, identify that and shrink it for next time. Slide, please. So the focus for the cybersecurity industry and community has been largely on building technical skills. So technical skills, you know, like let's say SANS training, CompTIA training, all great, incredible training, very important, but it's not enough, and neither is uh, Intel threat sharing. So it's great that we share. Um, but it's, it's not sufficient in and of itself to make us a mission effective. We really need our team members to be expert planners and leaders. You know, I say leadership because whenever you mission plan, brief, execute, or debrief, each one of those phases of the algorithm, operational algorithm of PBED require leadership. So when you mission plan, you need a mission planning self chief. You will, someone will be directing and leading the mission planning process. Same with Briefing. When you're briefing, you're leading the conversation. You're, you're, you, you are uh, essentially not just building consensus, but you are you know, uh, leading the team to what the expectations are during the mission. During mission execution, you have typically a mission commander. A mission commander is going to be leading uh, through the phases of execution and then making certain operational decisions and calls. Um, that they have, that have been pre-planned. And so um, there's a leadership role there as well. And then also you might see that with some of the package commanders. And then also during the debrief, again, leadership required because you will lead, you'll lead that process, you will lead the discussion, you will help direct the, the, uh, the attention of those that are participating. And so uh, leadership is, is, a, is paramount in each of those uh, phases. Slide, please. Now, I think sometimes students, especially coming through our schoolhouse, are hoping that 
you know, based on what they've seen from Hollywood movies or what they've seen in the Air Force commercial, they're hoping that there's, you know, they'll be in, you know, they'll go back behind the door, hear the secret information, the top secret information, and find out that there is some sort of magic cyber button that we push and suddenly our networks are defended. I've got bad news for you that the there is no Iron Man you know, Jarvis that just doesn't exist. There, there is no artificial intelligence, no machine learning uh, solution that we just push you know, or activate that somehow exploits our adversary's network or helps defend our network or just keeps our networks going. The, the most powerful capability we have is America's sons and daughters and the wetware uh, between their ears and behind their eyeballs. That's you. And that is our most powerful cap combat capability. And, and so um, this particular training is meant to develop those critical thinking skills and then prepare you for the, the, the moment that your commander or you know, uh, the operational problem set you know, drops in your lap or the commander booger flicks something into your lap and says, hey, we, we have this tough tactical problem. We need you to solve it. The intent of this training is to make you comfortable so that you can. Um, but unfortunately, there's, there's no magic button that you just hit and it, and it takes care of it for you. So that's why we're going to train. Slide, please. One unfortunate part of our community a little bit is that we're not necessarily known for producing type A, this dominant take charge style Le you know, leaders, you know, there's a reason that the cyber nerd stereotype exists. You know, are do are they out there? Yes. Do we have Type A leaders? Yes. Um, but you know, we haven't. Net we we focused a lot on technical skills, and we focused um, in in other areas. I wouldn't say that we've really honed some of the leadership and tactical planning skills, but this training is meant to address that. Slide, please. Now, as, as we see throughout history and from certain strategists, you know, mastering yourself is a true power. You know, when, I, when I reflect back on what mastering yourself means in the context of uh, tactical planning, briefing, and debriefing, it really comes into play there uh, on the debriefing side. But to be able to, the, to debrief effectively, you have to be able to do critical self-analysis. And the reason that's so important is because this is an, it's an algorithm. So if you don't debrief correctly and get the right lessons learned, you can't roll that into planning. So the plan, the next plan, doesn't get any better unless the debriefing occurs. And so because it is an algorithm and the outputs from the debrief will inform the next plan, it, it, each phase is extremely important. And so one of the biggest issues that we run into, and, and this is what I was alluding to, is that Critical self-analysis is often missing in our, in our com uh, community. Um, when I say community, I'm talking about the cyber warfare, the cyber ops community. So um, part of this training today is meant to address how we develop that thick skin so that we can have critical self-analysis um, and use it to make our plans better for the next go. Slide, please. So imagine a world where Everyone on your team has top tier technical training. Incredible partnerships exist. exist. Um, there's near perfect threat intelligence and your budgets are healthy. Is that a perfect world? You would think so, but not so much. It's like baking a cake, right? So you want the ingredients to be fused in a meaningful way at the right, at the, at the right time in the right proportions. And, and that's what planning is. It allows, it, it allows you to bring the right resources to bear uh, at the right times and in the right uh, pr proportions to achieve the objective. And so, you know, a, a great example of that would be the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound, right? So we had you know, amazing training from our JSOC operators. We had incredible partnerships. You have near-perfect threat intelligence. You know, we're talking some of the world's greatest intelligence agencies working together to achieve this objective. And the, their budgets are legendary for being massive. Did everything go perfect? No, everything didn't go perfect. You know, there was a, uh, the, the operators crashed, unfortunately they crashed a helicopter. 
Um, and also, not only did they crash the helicopter, but another thing that didn't go perfect was when they went to go destroy that helicopter, components were left behind. So the point is, is that it's not a perfect world. You, you, you have, even if you have all those in, ingredients, everything has to come together or mistakes can be made. Now, were they still mission effective? Many would argue, yes, the objective was to kill or capture Osama bin Laden. They, um, they achieved that outcome. But only after accounting for, you know, what to do if they crash a helicopter, you know, they, they had to account for many things to include what to do if they crash a helicopter, right? So how do we know that they planned you know, what to do if they crash a helicopter? Well, they had, they had the, re, you know, the materials there to destroy it um, in case that did happen. So we know that they at least had accounted for that portion of, you know, what, of what to do. But not even that went, uh, you know, according to plan because of, as I mentioned before, they left certain components behind. So planning is key. The, a, a, big, a, a big part of analyzing how things went on a mission is asking three key questions. What was the plan? Did we stick to the plan and was the plan sufficient? So in the example of the Osama bin Laden raid, you know, what was the plan? The plan was to go in, get him, um, and get out. And there, there was a lot more to it, but I'm, I'm using rough surgery here. Did they stick to the plan? Yes, they did. They got him out, but there were some things that went sideways. You know, and, and in the process of things going sideways, crashing the helicopter, was the plan sufficient? Well, yeah. Uh, one would argue the plan was not sufficient because there were still parts of that aircraft that were left behind and were not destroyed. And so as, they, as those operators debriefed that night, they likely would have focused 90% of their attention on the 10% that didn't go right. So it's a legendary mission. I, you know, in addition to high-fiving each other you know, for being mission effective and finally getting Osama bin Laden, who the, air, who, who the United States had been chasing down for so long, there was also parts to reflect on you know, what could have gone better. And so, uh, again, it, it, it takes critical self-analysis. Slide, please. So, as I mentioned on the previous slide, cakes are for sharing. Does anybody have a, a uh, war story they'd like to share? It's rhetorical because we're on video, but now would be a good time to pause the video and, you know, reflect on some event in your life. You know, if you're prior enlisted, we got Guard and Reserve, you know, it, Think about a time when things did not go quite as well as you would want them to go. And, and that, uh, you know, what was the plan? Did you stick to the plan? Was the plan sufficient? Now's a good time to share, you know, with your classmates or just reflect on that. We're going to take a short pause here before we get into the next slide. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to just phase into the next. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's going to happen differently. Okay. And then after when I have the question out there, which I'm trying to figure out how to write it down. Okay. So it's gonna like probably like a little pop up. So resume. Perfect. Okay. I'm gonna jump right in. Go. Super. All right, and we're back. So uh, hopefully you were able to reflect on some sort of war story, something that happened to you or you know uh, about that happened to somebody else, or someone was able to share in your classroom. But the the point is is just reflecting on. An, a time in the past when things went sideways, you know, and you asked the question, you know, what was the plan? Did we stick to the plan? And was the plan sufficient? All right, next slide. All right, so let's talk for a second about the, the problem, uh, problem statement, solution statement. So we, we talked already about why tactical planning is important. And it is that uh, in the plan brief, execute, debrief, is that operational algorithm. Those are the operational behaviors that we would expect to be able to, uh, to, to uh, perform very well if we're going to move from JV to varsity and the cyber warfare community. But I want to talk a little bit about the solution state. So plan brief, execute, debrief, and the tactical and tactical planning processes don't work very well if you're, if, if you're not addressing a tactical problem. So it would not be a very good um, solution set if you were trying to solve an operational level problem. So the, the methodology itself has been around for decades. Whether we're talking about you know, world-class athletes or Navy SEALs, 
fighter pilots in the Air Force or uh, Green Berets, that methodology has been around for a long time. It's not something that cyber guys or gals dreamed up and then just came up with on their own. Really, if you study any high-performing team, I'll give a real quick example, the British cycling team. So in the book, Atomic Habits, they do a great job breaking this down. But you know, was, the example in Atomic Habits is that the British cycling team hadn't won any significant um, uh, you know, tournaments or, or, uh, or races in uh, many, many years, but then they brought in a new coach, and he adhered to a, the theory of ag uh, the, mar the, uh, the aggregate of marginal gains. So the idea is that if you can do 100 things, just 1% better, you can win championships, and you can win races, you can win tournaments, you can win, you, you, you can win, win, win. And so they debriefed everything. You know, they, they were gathering data. And then taking a look at, okay, well, it took us 10 minutes to do this particular task. Is Can we do this task in 9 minutes, 59 seconds? Can we do it? And then once they got it down to 9 minutes, 59 seconds, they were looking, well, oh, what would it take to get us down to 9 minutes, 58 seconds? They kept just chipping away. And after years of doing this, they, were able, they started winning the Tour de France, and they started winning all these major races. And so that included being almost like obsessive about it. So for instance, they, you know, kind of broad strokes here, but if I remember correctly, they like put, you know, new seats on all the bikes. They re-engineered them to be slightly more comfortable so that when you're riding, you know, it, it's, it's less discomfort to the rider, which means they can go greater distance with greater comfort and just apply more focus on, you know, uh, riding versus uh, their mind being distracted about how much pain they're in. They also changed out the fabrics of their, uh, you know, their riding gear. So if I remember correctly, they, they did some studies and looked at, you know, if we change materials, fabrics, we can be just marginally more aerodynamic and, and with more comfort. They also took a look at, you know, well, what's the maintenance cycle for some of our, uh, for, for some of our equipment? And they found that some dust was finding its way into some of the gears and they wanted to be able to just be to, to reduce that dust and so they if i remember correctly they painted the inside of all their trailers white so that they could see specks of dust just more clearly and then just maintain a more clean uh, environment they also found that if they if the um, uh, cyclists slept at you know at home in their own bed that they got you know, just a couple more minutes of quality sleep. And so what they did with their fixed action was to take their beds on the road. So whatever country they were traveling in, they would, they would uh, go through the, you know, the expense of bringing those, excuse me, those beds on the road. And so what that meant was that they were, the, their, uh, the, the cyclists were getting more quality sleep. And so just the aggregate of all of those marginal gains made a big difference, but they wouldn't know that if they weren't debriefing. So this, whether we're talking about Green Berets, Navy SEALs, or, you know, peak athletes, that methodology has been around for a very long time. We're just now learning the benefits of, of applying it to cyber warfare operations. So the results uh, tend to be increased mission success rates, tighter collaboration between teams. We're developing leaders, right? It's because we're going through that algorithm so much more frequently. And so now many, many more of the cyber warfare operators are able to lead mission planning cells, mission briefings, and execution, whether it be as a mission commander or package commander, and then also a debrief, uh, the debriefing uh, itself. And so leaders are being developed. And I had already talked about the difference between operational level uh, planning and tactical level planning, but the, the scope of this particular framework is on tactical problems, discrete tactical problems within typically one ATO or CTO day. Slide, please. All right, so we've I've introduced you to why it's important and where it applies. What I want to do now is walk you through the operational 
art itself, the basic principle of the algorithm, the operational algorithm. So it's mission planning, briefing, execution, and debrief. So mission planning, the end state there being you have an outline of the effort or the mission itself. The end state of the mission brief is that you have all team members uh, understanding the plan. We'll talk about why that's so important. Um, execution is all the expected tasks are going to be complete. So that's the end state there of execution. And then the end state of the debrief is lessons learned, best practices are identified. And then um, it ideally um, set up to roll into the next plan. Slide, please. Let's talk about just some of the history here, some key lessons learned for those that don't recognize the image. This is going to be from Operation Eagle Claw. This is the failed attempt to rescue the Iranian hostages. Um, and, you know, some mistakes were made. Lessons were learned. Um, slide, please. This is from the Bay of Pigs. Again, mistakes were made. Lessons were learned. Slide. And this is, you know, for those that are familiar, uh, the Black Hawk Down uh, situation. So, again, uh, underestimated enemy strength, underestimated their ability to coordinate, did not send in enough um, blue forces, and as a result were um, outgunned, outmanned, and uh, outcoordinated. And so what we find at, you know, as, as we reflect back on these um, failures is that they were not just mission failures themselves, but really when we ask those same three key questions. What was the plan? Did we stick to the plan? And was the plan sufficient? Um, the, the, the answers to those questions are um, very illuminating. And as we uh, progress to the next slide, if we think to ourselves, you know, okay, well, what does you know, if we were to apply mission planning, you know, what, 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 briefing and debriefing, what do those look like in practical terms? Well, you know, on the slide, you, you can see mission planning uh, during like War II. Hovering around a map saying, okay, we're gonna ingress from this area, we're gonna egress this way, we're gonna drop our bombs here, you know, this person's gonna be in lead, you know, this person's gonna be in support. Mission planning, there, there's a lot of different ways in, that, that it might look uh, in practical implementation. Exe you know, mission mission uh, uh, execution itself, we've got a picture there of some Navy SEALs um, executing a training mission, and then mission uh, uh, debriefing. I've got some cyber operators there uh, debriefing how one of their missions went. But mission planning, briefing, execution, debriefing, it's going to look different. But, you know, based on which domain of warfare you're operating in, but the key principles are the same. Slide, please. Let's talk for a second about the, uh, not just the importance of it, but the, the context in which it's been applied in the past. So this picture, if you're not familiar, is the Tuskegee Airmen. They're uh, most famous for being the red-tailed uh, bomber escort there in World War II. You know, we were learning some pretty hard lessons about uh, aircraft, aircraft and air crew attrition rates, um, you know, and, and that we needed fighter escort for our bombers. And so when that lesson was learned and we started applying those lessons, we had uh, these incredible heroes like the Tuskegee Airmen who applied those lessons to great effect to help us be more mission effective. Slide, please. This is a picture of Captain Phillips. And so for those that aren't familiar with this uh, story, the, there was a, um, a uh, container ship that was uh, taken uh, hostage by some um, uh, Somali pirates, if I remember correctly. And the, we had some JSOC operators that went to go um, address that situation in, off the coast of Africa. And it was successful in the sense that, you know, bad guys died, good guys lived. We were able to, you know, save the life of the captain and, and get the uh, cargo back uh, safe and under um, the control of those who should be controlling it. 
But, you know, that's our story. That's not necessarily a story of every time a mission like this has been conducted. There actually was another country who had uh, a similar incident uh, not that long after uh, what happened with, uh, with Captain Phillips. And when that country's special ops team went in to go and, um, you know, uh, ad address the situation, you know, and kill the bad guys, save the good guys, it didn't go quite so well. Now, there's a lot of different factors involved there, but um, the, I can promise you that it was the, the mission was more effective for, uh, on the U.S. side because of our planning, briefing, and execution, and debriefing algorithm that we just obsess about. That's what makes, made our mission just that much more successful. Slide, please. And this is uh, an overhead picture of the Osama bin Laden compound in, uh, in Abbottabad. Again, slide. A key point here is that successful missions, and all of these were successes, they're debriefed too, so that best practices can be identified. So it's not just those mission failures, but it, it is mission successes too, because we want to um, repeat those, uh, those successes. Slide, please. So when we take a look beyond just military context, Formula One is a great example. I'm a Formula One nut. I didn't get into the sport until about two years uh, ago or so. But they obsess on, on performance. So if they can just shave off milliseconds, they want to do it. And so the aggregate of marginal gain is very much alive and well in Formula One. Slide, please. Another um, industry or uh, you know, space that we, we see obsession about marginal gains that's going to be in the aerospace industry. And then specifically, um, I use NASA as an example. There's a great video out there about, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the, I think it's, oh, it could be Orion if I remember correctly, but basically they have this telescope that is mounted inside a jumbo jet. and They fly it around and they take pictures of the sky from a moving aircraft. But uh, in this video itself, they're interviewing these scientists and they ask them, you know, hey, can you tell us about what one of your standard, you know, they're going to go do some stargazing uh, through this telescope. And they say, you know, can you tell us a little bit about what this, uh, what this is like? And you've got this scientist uh, who's walking through the, what a standard observation looks like. And she, she says, well, we go get, you know, we plan what stars we're going to look at. And we, we uh, talk about the priority of which stars we're going to look at first. And then we start talking about, you know, what the weather is like because, you know, again, they're on board an aircraft. So, you know, there's the mission planning portion. Then they brief uh, w what they're going to do. And then they get a brief from the aircraft of, of how the flight's going to go. Then they go execute. And then when they're done, they do a debrief. So they take a look at the data. Um, and so, again, uh, the principles can be applied in, in many different um, industries and spaces. Slide, please. GE, you know, it's interesting. I worked at GE prior to coming on active duty. And those of you who have a little bit of a business background might uh, be familiar with the, the um, methodologies of Six Sigma. Again, it's mostly looking at, you know, what are the constraints? You know, what, are, what are the issues? How do we address them? And how do we become more effective? But again, the idea is uh, what works, what doesn't work, address them. Uh, to become just, uh, to suck less, more or less. Slide, please. So the endless pursuit of perfection. I like showing this slide for a couple of reasons. If you haven't watched uh, uh, Yuri Dreams of Sushi, it's on net, it was on Netflix, I don't know if it still is, but it is an incredible documentary about one of the top sushi uh, chefs in the world. And what's interesting about this, when you watch it, you know, it's, it's very entertaining, but if you look at it through the lens of uh, just planning, briefing, execution, and debriefing, what you see is this incredible obsession on uh, performance and the, just the absolute pursuit of, of his craft, in his case, making sushi. A little bit of background here. So he's, if I remember correctly, he's been making sushi for over 70-something years. He uh, started making sushi essentially as a child. You know, uh, the, I forget what happened, I don't know if his parents passed away or what, but he, he started making sushi at a very young age. He's perfected his craft over many decades. And, and when you're watching the documentary, it's incredible 
just to see the lengths they go through to make it the best sushi in the world. So for instance, it costs a couple hundred dollars just to get a reservation at, this, at, at their restaurant. Their restaurant is in a Tokyo subway and only seats like 13 people. And it's booked out months in advance. It is regarded as the top sushi location in the world. And what's interesting about it is, it, to me, it's one of the purest implementations of uh, plan brief, execute debrief, at least in the, in the culinary world. Uh, they, they have debriefed how to make the rice. They, it, they, over the course of many years, they have, they have found through thousands and thousands of iterations that uh, the exact temperature, the exact pressure, the exact rice supplier that they need to achieve uh, the best outcome. They've done the same with uh, uh, how they procure their you know, seafood. They have exclusive suppliers, and they have found this out over the course of decades. The other thing that they do I thought was pretty cool is they do rock drills. They do a rehearsal. So what they do is they will make the food in the morning, and they test it out just to make sure that it's right. In the documentary, you'll see that they have their, their um, apprentice, uh, their apprentice, apprentices, apprentice, whatever the singular, is, uh, the, the whatever the the plural of apprentices, apprentices, they have them work for up to thirteen years before they're even able to make the eggs. What you think about that? Thirteen years before they're able to even make the eggs unsupervised. All right, so uh, there's this incredible passion for perfection. Not only uh, that, but they study, like, who's on the guest list? Male, you know, is it a, is a man? Is it a woman? Um, are they right-handed? Are they left-handed? Because they have certain repeat customers. They, they make note of all this stuff. They debrief it, and then they figure out, okay, if they're right-handed, they need to sit over here. If, they're, uh, if, it's a, uh, if it's a man, they might make it a slightly larger portion, versus if it's a small female, they might make it a slightly smaller proportion. So uh, there's a lot that goes into it, but um, to be the best, you have to put in that level of, of effort. Um, this picture is a picture of uh, David, uh, if I remember correctly, his name is David Scott. He's the world's most accomplished triathlete. This is a person who has uh, the, um, debriefed his diet to the point where he strains his cottage cheese just to retain the right fats and get rid of the wrong fats. But that's how you become the best. And of course, um, a lot of people are going to recognize Michael Phelps, the most decorated Olympian of, uh, across history. And uh, the more you read about Michael Phelps, the more you see he is mission planning, briefing, executing, and debriefing as well. There's some really good uh, materials out there if you want to look at what his pre-race uh, uh, diet, workout, playlist, his, the sequence in which he does his stretches, Everything is mission planned. They mission brief. He will go out and execute. And then there's a very comprehensive debrief on how the race went. And if when properly applied, um, you can perform at the highest levels. All right, so uh, I've, I've walked you through the why. I've walked you through the, uh, what it looks like in practical military um, implementation and then also non-military. What I'm going to do now, next slide, is start going into the, each of the phases of the algorithm itself. So mission planning is what we're going to hit first. And again, as a reminder, the outcome, the expected outcome of, the, of mission planning is that there is an outline of the effort or the mission itself. Slide.